I wonder of those who support Super Mac in this case, how many of those are not McDonald's haters? I'm Andre Minkov, the founder of Trademark Factory, and in this video, I'm gonna share my thoughts about yet another trademarking screw up. This time around, it's McDonald's losing yet another dispute to Super Mac. This time around, it's around their Mac trademark in EU. All right, let me start by reading from the article. You can always find the link in the description below. And then I'm also gonna go through the decision itself so that you can see for yourself what this whole thing is all about. McDonald's loses second Mac trademark case against Supermax. McDonald's has lost its exclusive claim to the Mac trademark on some of its food products within the EU after a dispute with an Irish fast food chain. Supermax, which owns more than 100 fast food restaurants in Ireland, complained to the European Union Intellectual Property Office, EU IPO. EU IPO ruled McDonald's had not proved genuine use of the Mac prefix on some of the products it trademarked, Mac Bully. However, the EU IPO upheld McDonald's's right to use the Mac trademark on chicken nuggets and some of its sandwich products. The ruling also stated that as both firms had succeeded in some parts of the case and failed on others, each party must pay its own costs. Supermax was founded by Galway businessman Pat McDonough in 1978, which is after McDonald's, and is now the largest Irish-owned fast food restaurant firm in the Republic of Ireland. Mr. McDonough, who previously referred to his global fast food rival as McBully, said the latest ruling was a victory for small businesses. The Mac is back, he declared in a company statement. Oh, really? Uh, McDonald's tried to argue that because they had some products that started with Mac, that the term Mac was so synonymous with them that they had the right to own and trademark Mac, he added. We are delighted that the EU IPO found in our favor and that we can now say that we have rid Europe of the McDonald's self-styled monopoly of the term Mac. Okay, core menu items. However, a statement from McDonald's pointed out that EU IPO ruling had reinforced its ownership of the Mac trademark on a selection of its fast food products. The EU IPO upheld McDonald's's EU registration for the trademark Mac standing alone for certain core menu items which McDonald's uses in connection with its famous family of Mac prefix trademarks. The US firm's statement said, the decision does not impact McDonald's's ability to use its Mac prefix trademarks or other trademarks throughout Europe and the world, and McDonald's will continue to enforce its rights. Supermax took the case after a branding dispute halted the Irish company's attempts to expand its restaurant chain into the UK and Europe. Long running dispute, McDonald's has won an earlier battle over the similarity between the name Supermax and the Big Mac. Supermax then asked the EU IPO to rule on the issue and the Irish firm won a partial victory in January of 2019. And we had a separate video on that. Make sure you watch it. And we're gonna put that in the, in the card up there, hopefully. If we haven't done it, Post a comment below to remind me to do that, but we're, do our, we're gonna do our best to put the, the card to link to the other uh, Big Mac video that I did. All right, at that time, the EU IPO ruled that McDonald's had not proved genuine use of the trademark term Big Mac as a burger or restaurant name. The latest EU IPO ruling revokes McDonald's's uh, automatic trademark rights to the use of the term Mac, on a long list of food products, drinks, and restaurant services within the EU. However, the EU body upheld the US firm's right to use the Mac trademark on chicken nuggets and a range of its sandwich products, including meat, fish, pork, and chicken sandwiches. McDonald's had argued that due to its long and continuous use of the Mac term, the trademark had become widely and exclusively associated with McDonald's 
by EU consumers. And of course it did. The US firm also pointed to several earlier decisions in favor issued by courts and trademark offices throughout Europe. But Supermax argued that Mac was the very common prefix for surnames throughout Ireland, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere throughout the European Union. It pointed out that there were a huge number of pubs, hotels, restaurants, and food products which contained the prefix Mac as part of a surname. The Irish firm claimed that McDonald's had never used the prefix Mac in a standalone sense, but only in combination with other words to brand their products. It's not a Mac chicken sandwich. It's a Mac chicken sandwich, the document states, which actually is a sound argument. I have to give it to Supermax, right? Uh, that's a good, that's, that's, that's the legitimate claim. So, but let's keep going. The EU IPO agreed with Supermax that there was no evidence of use of the contested trademark Mac alone, but only accompanied by further elements. Okay, so first of all, looks like this article, uh, the whoever wrote it really was getting paid by the word because it just keeps going on and on and on about the same thing. Uh, and uh, really the, the uh, summary is very simple. Uh, there was a dispute. Uh, this Irish guy wanted to have McDonald's's trademark canceled uh, and McDonald's holds the trademark in EU for just two, two letters, MC, Mac, right? Over a bunch of different products and services. And so uh, Supermax wanted to get that canceled based on the fact that McDonald's has not used that trademark Mac by itself, right? And they were claiming that uh, the use of the, the, the word Mac as part of a bigger brand like McNuggets or uh, McFlurry or something else, or even McDonald's by itself, uh, does not constitute the use of the trademark Mac by itself. And so they're saying, well, uh, they don't have a chicken sandwich that's called Mac, they have a sandwich that's called McChicken. So uh, that, that's a sound argument, but apparently, as uh, you know now, uh, EU IPO, said, we're gonna cancel this mark for some of the products and services covered by the application and we're gonna keep it for some others. So let's go through the actual judgment uh, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I'm gonna go through this quickly so that you can see what happened. And uh, that would be a good lesson in terms of how do you approach situations when you're trying to build a family of marks uh, and uh, a lot of them share the same prefix. So let's go right into it. All right, so cancellation. So Supermax goes after McDonald's. Uh, and uh, so the decision, you already know what it is, partially upheld. Uh, they went after this trademark and revoked some of the items. And uh, so they revoked foods prepared for meat and poultry products, uh, except for chicken nuggets foods prepared from pork and fish products, preserved and cooked fruits and vegetables, eggs, cheese, milk, milk preparations, and pickles. Uh, they removed biscuits, bread, cakes, cookies, chocolate, coffee, coffee substitutes, tea, mustard, oatmeal, pastries, sauces, seasonings, sugar, and desserts. Uh, they removed non-alcoholic beverages, syrups, and other preparations for making beverages, and they removed restaurant services, but they kept chicken nuggets, and they kept edible sandwiches, meat sandwiches, pork sandwiches, fish sandwiches, and chicken sandwiches. Okay, and they made everyone bear their own costs, so everyone's paying their lawyers. All right, so here are the reasons. So they said, so Supermax filed this request uh, to get it all canceled, uh, and so the applicant, which is the, uh, the uh, Irish Supermax, requests to have the contested trademark revoked with effect from five years following the date of registration. So in EU, uh, if a mark is not used for five years continuously uh, before somebody requests to cancel it, if they can't show the use uh, in the preceding five years, that trademark can be canceled. So this term, five years, uh, is pretty long in, uh, let's say in Canada and US, that term is three years, uh, but in EU it's five. Uh, and, and, and this varies from country to country. So, okay, uh, so that's what they wanted. And uh, the reason behind it was that, the reason they wanna cancel it is that it was not put to genuine use 
by or with the consent of the proprietor in relation to all of the goods and services covered by the registration, right? So they say uh, that uh, in 2017, uh, McDonald's filed written observations and evidence of use. So they got 20 attachments, which will be listed and analyzed further down in the following section of the decision. So uh, McDonald's provided their arguments, they provided their evidence uh, long before they heard the outcome of the Big Mac case. So I'm sure they were overconfident and again, gotta watch my video on the Big Mac. And uh, there you will know that McDonald's lost to a big extent because they didn't take it seriously enough. They didn't provide good enough evidence. And so had they learned that lesson faster, I'm sure they would have filed more than 20 uh, attachments for this case, but they did what they did. So uh, they say, so uh, McDonald's paperwork provides explanations and a description of the items filed as proof of use and submits that the evidence is sufficient to demonstrate that the contested uh, trademark has been used genuinely in relation to all of the registered goods and services with the exception of oatmeal. So the McDonald's says, you know, we've used it for everything. We've used it for everything. We've had it for, uh, we've uh, used it for biscuits, uh, cakes, cookies, uh, chocolate, sauces, pastries, mustard, everything except for oatmeal. We don't do oatmeal, they say. Okay, uh, so in the observations in reply, the Irish guy says they challenges the evidence filed by McDonald's uh, and they say essentially that if the office is minded to accept the evidence as sufficient and functioning evidence of use, the threshold for which has clearly not been met, then the evidence would only be sufficient to maintain the registration for, at the very most, uh, foods prepared from poultry products, edible sandwiches, meat sandwiches, pork sandwiches, fish sandwiches, chicken sandwiches, coffee, coffee substitutes, tea, pastries, desserts being ice cream in classes 29 and 30. And as we know, uh, UI, EUIPO actually went further than that. And then it says in its last submission, uh, McDonald's contests the applicant's claims in relation to the evidence of use and submits further explanations as to the documents previously filed. Okay, so grounds for decision. Uh, they say uh, the trademark will be canceled if within a continuous period of five years, trademark has not been put to genuine use in European unions for the goods and services for which it is registered and there is no proper reasons for non-use. Okay, uh, genuine use of a trademark exists where the trademark is used in accordance with its essential function, which is to guarantee the identity of the origin of the goods or services for which it's registered in order to create or preserve an outlet for those goods and services. Genuine use requires actual use of the market of the registered goods and services and does not include token use for the sole purpose of preserving the rights conferred by the mark, nor use which is solely internal. Okay, this is pretty much consistent with how cancellation is treated uh, everywhere. Uh, and then they say, when assessing whether use of the trademark is genuine, regard must be had to all the facts and circumstances relevant to establishing whether commercial exploitation of the mark is real, particularly whether such use is used as warranted in the economic sector concerned to maintain or create a market share for the goods and services protected by the mark. Okay, so, and again, we're gonna post the link to this decision, uh, but, uh, let, let me just keep going. In revocation proceedings, based on the grounds of non-use, the burden of proof lies with the trademark owner, EUTM proprietor, as the applicant cannot be expected to prove a negative fact, namely that the mark has not been used during a continuous period of five years. Therefore, it is the EUTM proprietor who must prove genuine use within the European Union or submit proper reasons for non-use that make sense. Uh, actually, in some countries, all you have to do to request cancellation is just do that. They please cancel this mark and then you don't have to prove anything. This is the case in Canada. Uh, in US, oh, and by the way, so when you do that in Canada, the, the, the trademark owner needs to show all the evidence and uh, the only thing that the uh, uh, petitioner needs to do is provide arguments why they don't like the evidence by the uh, by the trademark owner in the U.S. It's a lot more involved 
So you can't just say, well, we're using it, now prove it that we don't. Uh, and uh, so in Canada, you, they, they can't do that, right? They have to show evidence right away. In US, they can say, nope, we're using it, we're all, we're all good. Show, show us that we're not. And then it goes back to the uh, petitioner to provide some evidence. So in EU, the, the, the full burden is on the trademark registrant. So let's keep going. Uh, so McDonald's provided the, the evidence. And uh, so there's some confidentiality stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, so we're not gonna talk about that. So here's the evidence. Here's the evidence. Three affidavits. Uh, so there's all sorts of stuff about use here, 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 and there. Uh, you can go through the list of these attachments, uh, but we'll, we'll uh, go through what uh, EU IPO actually said about them. So preliminary remarks. First of all, they say examination of individual pieces of evidence. There's shown above under the summary of the party's arguments, applicant individually assesses and challenges all of the items of evidence uh, stating on the main that these do not indicate genuine use. Well, this is what you always do, right? Somebody shows evidence, say, no, doesn't prove anything. <laughs> uh, and the applicant's argument is based on an individual assessment of each item of evidence, okay? Uh, even if some relevant factors are lacking in some items of evidence, the combination of all relevant factors is okay. Uh, so used by a third party, uh, the applicant further contends that the affidavits are not made by any employee of the registrant, uh, exactly the uh, arguments they made in the Big Mac case. Uh, since no evidence setting out the link between the proprietor and the executors of those documents have been supplied, they can be construed uh, as evidence that proves used by or with the proprietor's consent. So this is very procedural, uh, procedural, and uh, it's it's very important when you go to the dispute. It's not just about who's right and who's wrong. It's also about who knows the rules of evidence better, who knows the rules of procedure better, because you can be right 100%, uh, but if you don't follow the rules of procedure, you may lose a totally winnable case. That happens all the time. So uh, this argument of the applicant cannot succeed either. Uh, first, it's recalled that but when the EU proprietor submits evidence of use by third party, there's an implicit indication that it consented to the use. All right, so basically they say, no, we're gonna accept this evidence, don't worry about it. Uh, and then translation of the evidence, applicant further contends that part of the evidence is not accompanied by a translation through the language of the proceedings and should be disregarded. Uh, and uh, with particular reference survey, further argues that the deadline for filing of the translation has now passed. So they're trying to remove evidence, exclude evidence. Uh, and uh, it's clarified that a uh, trademark owner is not under any obligation to translate the proof of use unless it is specifically requested to do so by the office. Uh, and uh, so they say, uh, in the present case, proprietor included in its submissions a summary in English of the relevant parts of the document. Therefore, the applicant had information about the content of the evidence filed. So they say, we're gonna accept that. Okay, uh, accept, now this is the important stuff. Assessment of a genuine use of the factors. Time and place of use. So they say, okay, the evidence must show genuine use of the contested mark within the relevant period. So going back from the time when the Irish uh, Supermax filed their request for cancellation, going back five years. So it's not about when they registered it, it's about, and it's also not about when the uh, EU IPO is hearing the case. So the relevant period is somebody files the request to cancel their mark and then they go back five years and the trademark owner must show evidence of use within that period. So they say part of the evidence is dated with the relevant time frame as detailed above. Uh, however, there is no, and, 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 and some of it, some documents, it's true that the applicant contends some documents bear handwritten indication of the year. However, there is no reason for the cancellation division to doubt the accuracy of that indication since it's most instances the noting in manuscript is backed up by time information included in the document itself, such as, for example, a copyright notice in the respective year. So again, uh, the, the lawyers for the Irish company is doing everything right. They're attacking, 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 attacking. If they can exclude evidence, 
Uh, even if the evidence doesn't prove anything, uh, they want it out. They want to uh, win on the procedure, and that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, that's exactly how they succeeded in the Big Mac case. So, and uh, then they're going, uh, so some of the documents are outside the relevant period, but the images of products uh, relate to the relevant goods on the internet. Printouts, screenshots provide information regarding the type of goods or proprietor manufacturing. Okay, cannot be ignored. So basically what they're saying is, all right, some of this evidence may point to uh, things that occurred outside of this period, but it's still relevant. Okay, so they're, they didn't exclude that. So extent of use, that's the important one. Concerning the extent of use, it's settled case law that account must be taken, in particular, in the, of the commercial volume of the overall use, as well as the length of the period during which the mark was used and the frequency of use. Okay. Furthermore, it will be recalled that the assessment of genuine use entails a degree of independent, interdependence between the factors taken into account. Thus, the fact that commercial volume achieved under the mark was not high may be offset by the fact that use of the mark was extensive or very regular and vice versa. Likewise, the territorial scope of the use is only one of the several factors to be taken into account so that a limited territorial scope of use can be counteracted by a more significant volume of duration of use. Basically, what they're saying is when somebody's attacking your mark for non-use, you have to show that you've been acting, that you've been using the mark in a way that's substantial, right? Somewhat substantial. It doesn't have to be billions of dollars. Uh, it doesn't even have to be millions of dollars, but you have to use and you have to sell and uh, you have to sell in a way that would be regarded as genuine use that goes beyond just you trying to show that, well, we're reusing the trademark, let us keep the trademark. So use of the mark need not be quantitatively significant for it to be deemed genuine, right? So in addition, under certain circumstances, even circumstantial evidence, despite not providing direct information of the quantity of goods actually sold, can be sufficient by themselves to prove an extent of use in an overall assessment. What they're trying to say is it's not a very high threshold to prove. To keep the mark so from the outset they note that mcdonald's did not submit any invoices but relied instead on three affidavits that provide information on uh, the net turnover of mcdonald's the advertising expenditure for mcdonald's goods and services and the number of products sold in germany france and the uk respectively under the sign big mac and under a number of mac prefix signs namely mcrib mcmuffin mctoast mcfish mcwrap McNuggets, McChicken, and McFlurry. All right, uh, and further provides extracts from two annual reports giving the revenue in Europe. Uh, and basically, they're just showing that uh, uh, it was more general than uh, than specific. And again, that's probably uh, the the evidence that McDonald's is very unhappy that they filed in both the Big Mac case and in this case because they didn't take it seriously enough. They thought, well, we're McDonald's. Everybody knows McDonald's. Uh, I mean, what else do we need to show? Well, let's just show them general numbers. Let's just show them uh, how much money we spend on the ads. Let's just show them uh, how many uh, happy clients uh, eat our uh, products. And uh, any reasonable person would confirm that we get to keep the mark. Well, not so fast. Uh, and so they say, the right, final outcome depends on the overall assessment of the evidence, a particular case, blah, 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 uh, must be observed from the outset. The market in question is for the production and sale of fast food items that are intended for normal everyday use and for the provision of fast food restaurant services. Well known that such market is often characterized by relatively high demand and by the sale of high number of goods to the public at large. Therefore, the provision of traditional sales evidence, such as paper invoices, is not necessarily functional when it comes to trade held in the relevant market service. Okay, so uh, so they keep keep explaining which which is relevant, which is not so relevant, and um, they're just pretty much explaining the standard uh, they're using to come up with with uh, with their decision. Right? An overall assessment of the evidence cancellation decision deems that the documents, albeit not particularly extensive, demonstrate a certain scale of use of Big Mac and the Mac prefixed signs listed in the affidavits during the relevant period, which allows for the conclusion that the extent of use was not merely token. However, this applies only in relation to some of the goods and services for which the contested trademark is registered. 
as we'll be explained in detail in the following section of the decision nature of use, subsection use, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, however, account must be taken of the fact that contested trademark is the word sign Mac. Consequently, whether the evidence is sufficient for demonstrating genuine use of the sign further depends on whether the documents are apt in showing use of the mark in the form that does not alter its distinctive character, which will be further assessed by the cancellation decision in the following section of this because what they're saying is here they showed us the use of mac as part of the names of different food items but have they really showed us the use of the word mac by itself so let's see so for the sake of completeness it's noted that in addition to the signs mentioned in the three affidavits so namely mcdonald's big mac mcrib McNuff, mcmuffin mctoast mcfish mcwrap mcnuggets mcchicken and mcflory Proprietor submissions include references to seven other Mac prefix signs as follows. Uh, Mac croissant, claimed to have been used in relation to a croissant, including ham and eggs or chocolate. Mac morning uh, for breakfast products. What else? Mac baguette for uh, baguette sandwich. Uh, Mac curry worst uh, for sausages. Mac menu for a combination meal, Mac Cafe uh, for restaurant services, and uh, is there anything else? Mm, okay, and they also had Mac Sunday and Mac B, okay, for a, a bio beef sandwich or Mac Shaker in relation to fries. So having assessed the evidence produced by the trademark owner in relation to these other Mac prefix signs, Cancellation division deems that the documents are not capable of establishing genuine use of the contested mark as they do not contain sufficient particulars as to the extent of use. So here is where McDonald's again were too cocky. Uh, they were overconfident that all they have to do is say, well, here's your evidence, general numbers, and here's the list of all the names we've ever used. So from the procedure perspective, from the evidence perspective, that's not good enough because that use of those other names, they couldn't show how it linked back to the time period and the geographical location of use. So uh, that they're probably, uh, McDonald's lawyers are probably thinking, I wish we showed them more. And I'm sure they have genuine numbers. I'm sure they have genuine documents uh, that will show some use of at least some of these terms, but they didn't present them for the hearing and that's the problem. So let's keep going, all uh, right? So they, 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 they just say that, you know, the, these don't contain sufficient particulars, uh, contain images of products under the science of use and internet extracts show that the claimed goods are available online on the respective website. However, this is not sufficient to support uh, the proprietor's assertions of genuine use in relation to the contested goods marketed under these other signs or as the case may be the contested services offered there under uh, right so they contain no information on the number of products sold during the relevant period under any of the signs at issue uh, the only quantitative data of the cancellation decision was able to retrieve from the evidence concerning the sign mac cafe and more specifically that in france there are 187 mac cafe uh, within mcdonald's restaurants However, in the absence of further corroborating evidence and complementary information as to the actual use of the internet sites by potential and relevant consumers, uh, in particular that orders for the relevant goods have been made through the website by a certain number of customers in the relevant period, or complementary advertising and sales figures regarding the goods, the documents in these annexes are not in themselves apt to prove that the goods were actually put on sale in the relevant territory and to what extent so there right um so let's keep going so they did not make available other information and evidence which would serve to show the extent to which the signs concern have been commercially active for the relevant period in relation to the claimed goods and services and that use was such as to create or preserve an outlet for those products goods and services okay and so cancellation decision will further proceed to the assessment of the nature of use factor as regards the signs 
for which time, place, and extent were dem demonstrated, namely McDonald's, Big Mac, McRib, McMuffin, McToast, McFish, McRap, McNuggets, McChicken, and McFlurry. All right, first thing they look at is were the marks, was the mark in this case, used as registered, okay? So nature of use requires that contested trademark is used as a trademark, that is for identifying origin, thus making it possible for the relevant public to distinguish between goods and services of different providers. This is something I keep telling over and over again, right? That's the function of a trademark, to tell, to allow the market to tell your products and services from identical products and services of everyone else. So if your brand allows you to do that, that's a proper function of a trademark, that's a proper function of a brand. This is what you can protect and enforce against everyone else. So Irish Super Mac, right, the applicant, went to great length to criticize the evidence on the grounds that it does not show use of the trademark as a trademark and that the use of the sign was in a form which alters its distinctive character. Its main arguments can be summarized as follows. The contested trademark was not, nor has it ever been used as a trademark to designate the goods and services of the proprietor. It was filed as a defensive mark to prevent third parties from using trademarks and encompassing the MAC term for the goods and services of the registration or for similar goods and services, right? Second, MAC is a very common prefix for surnames throughout Ireland, UK, and elsewhere uh, in European Union. Use of the trademark MAC prefix with additional words and elements, which is the only evidence provided by the proprietor does not guarantee origin. Uh, there are a huge number of public houses, hotels, food items, beverages, and restaurants which contain the prefix MAC as part of the surname. So the third argument is the mark as registered has a relatively low degree of distinctiveness and the addition of elements has a serious effect on the distinctive character of the mark. So basically what they're saying is uh, Mc McFlurry is distinguishable not because it starts with Mac, but because of the whole thing, McFlurry. Same with McNuggets, same with, Big, same with McDonald's, same with pretty much everything that McDonald's has starting with Mac. So what Super Mac is saying is that to the extent that these names are distinguishable and distinctive and uh, trademarkable, it's not because they started with Mac, it's because of the whole thing. And then they say, proprietor does not and has never used Mac in and of itself. The additions of the terms included are not separate and distinct from the combination with the Mac element. It's not a Mac chicken sandwich, it's a Mac chicken sandwich, right? It's not a Mac rib sandwich, uh, it's a Mac rib sandwich, right? So the Mac element is never used separately. It's very clear that the proprietor has a marketing strategy of using a specific prefix just opposed uh, with additional elements and is only using its mark as new coined juxtaposed marks to create a new brand in line with a claimed Mac family of trademarks. In turn, McDonald's essentially puts forward that the mark Mac has been used as a prefix of the mark McDonald's and moreover of numerous product designations consisting of the prefix Mac in combination with a further element describing the nature or characteristic of their respective product Two, the term Mac is used to identify menu items and other goods and services prepared, sold, or rendered by McDonald's. And three, due to McDonald's' long and continuous use of the Mac term, this, this term has become widely and exclusively associated with McDonald's by consumers throughout the European Union, as demonstrated by surveys in, uh, in, in their evidence. And four, uh, findings in the said surveys provide that, uh, uh, prove that a very high level of distinctiveness of the designation Mac have already been confirmed by numerous decisions issued by courts and trademark offices throughout Europe. So what McDonald's is saying is that we may not necessarily use this separately from the products, but the public recognizes that when food items start with Mac, they probably come from McDonald's. All right, so that's their argument and it's a good argument. So. Cancellation division agrees with uh, the uh, Super Mac uh, lawyers that there is no evidence of use of the contested trademark alone, but only accompanied by further elements. Therefore, the question to be answered is whether the addition of these other verbal elements alters the distinctiveness of the contested trademark or not. Right, so they got uh, this table 
Right, so you have Mac and then McDonald's and Big Mac, McRib and all of that stuff. It cannot be deemed that the use of the sign McDonald's, so this is one, right, McDonald's, uh, constitutes use of the contested mark Mac in a form which does not alter the distinctive character of the mark as registered, since the two signs appear essentially different. So Mac and McDonald's are different. Well, duh. Uh, the additional element Donald's is not descriptive, devoid of distinctive character or weak for the services at issue. Moreover, it's not visually less standing than the element Mac, so that it can be construed that the difference between the registered and used form is a negligible element. It is true that there is no legal precept in the European Union trademark system that obliges the proprietor to provide evidence of the earlier mark alone when genuine use is required, and that two or more trademarks may be used together in an autonomous way or with the company name without altering the distinctive character of the earlier registered trademark. Uh, however, this is not the case for the present proceedings. It's clear from the evidence that Donald's is not an independent mark or sign which would refer to instance of the company mark, the manufacturer, uh, and so on. Furthermore, it's recalled that it's upon the proprietor of the mark to provide evidence of the additional sign is in fact an independent mark or sign which the latter failed to do. In the light of the foregoing, the use of the sign McDonald's cannot be regarded as an acceptable variation of the contested trademark. So here's what they're saying. They say, sometimes you could have a trademark inside another trademark, and they can both be treated as separate marks and protected as separate marks. But in order for that to happen, it's not enough for you to just protect one part of it. It has to be both. Right or the other side, the other half of it must not be distinctive enough so that the dominant element is the mark you're trying to prove. So in this case, they said, okay, we're looking at McDonald's, right? You never used Mac by itself. You're saying McDonald's is evidence that we're using the word Mac. And they say, well, are you ever using Donald's by itself? No. So you're using McDonald's, right? Yes. And if you're using McDonald's, then you're not using Mac trademark plus Donald's, right? So for example, when uh, you think of Microsoft Windows, right? They have Microsoft trademark, they have Windows trademark, and they have Microsoft Windows trademark, or Microsoft Office, or Microsoft this or that. Uh, Microsoft could prove, well, we're using Microsoft separately, and we're using Windows separately, and they all refer to a product or a service. So McDonald's couldn't say that, well, we're using Mac, and we're using Donald's, <laughs> right? Uh, and they couldn't say that the dominant part of the McDonald's trademark is Mac, right? They couldn't say, well, could be Mac anything, right? Uh, because what people really recognize is Mac. No, in case of McDonald's, people recognize McDonald's. So that was the defining by EU IPO, which is uh, something I agree with. And then they go uh, to just pretty much, you know, say the same thing, you know, McDonald's, McDonald's, restaurants, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, then they go, finally should be noted that Mark's McMuffin, McRib, McFlurry, Chick McNuggets, McChicken, Egg McMuffin, derived from McNug McDonald's trademark, fulfill all the conditions to form a family of trademarks within the meaning of the case law cited above and insofar as they are sufficient in number and reproduce in full the same distinctive element namely the element Mac, with the addition of a word element that differentiates them from each other and that they are characterized by the repetition of the same prefix, Mac, taken from the McDonald's trademark. So McDonald's says, okay, uh, sometimes we don't even have to prove any of this. If all of our trademarks or a lot of our trademarks share the same element, even if we don't trademark this separately, we have what's called a family of marks. And because of that, the family of marks allows you to claim monopoly over this common element. And so McDonald's says, well, we just went one step further. Instead of relying on the family of marks, we said, why don't we also register this as a separate trademark? Which is, again, not necessarily the wrong thing to do, but it's hard to prove use as McDonald's uh, McDonald's this example shows us right now. So let's keep going. Uh, 
So they say, as the Board of Appeal correctly observed, uh, the contested decision, McDonald's is trademarked with a reputation with fast food restaurant services, is the original trademark of the family to which all of the derived marks are connected by a common feature, namely the prefix Mac, and from which they are all separated by the same type of final element, which refers to one of the foodstuffs of the menu of the intervener's fast food restaurants, as is pointed out in contested decision. Right. This, the existence of a family of marks and the use of the registered trademark in a form which does not alter the distinctive character are, however, two different issues. A family of marks is an additional factor relating to the assessment of the likelihood of confusion, uh, or as the case may be, the existence of a link uh, of, of a link under Article 8.5. Right? Nature of use in the context of revocation proceedings under uh, this other article is one of the requirements to be proved by the trademark owner and relates to inter alia uh, evidence of the use of the mark as registered or of a, a variation thereof um, according to this article 18. Okay, uh, What the court confirmed in the McAfee case was the existence of a family of marks all characterized by the same prefix Mac taken from McDonald's's trademark but not that McDonald's and Mac are broadly equivalent or that the differences between them are negligible. That's a very good point. So they say, yes, you have a family of marks. We're not arguing this. What we're arguing is that, well, A, you're not using Mac by itself and B, that Mac and McDonald's are the same thing, which I'm sure McDonald's wouldn't want. Uh, but let's keep going. Uh, therefore, the proprietor's argument have to be set aside. All right, so basically they say, nope, too bad, so sad. Right, uh, and then they go through the, the other items. So uh, what was it, number two? Number two was, okay, Big Mac. So regarding the use of the sign under two, which is Big Mac, despite the proprietor's claims that Mac with an A is phonetically identical spelling of Mac without the A, the additional letter A placed between M and C substantially alters the visual appearance of the registered trademark Consequently, this difference constitutes an alteration of the distinctive character of the registered sign. So here, EUIPO said, we're not going to look at the fact that they sound the same. Uh, it's not just a sound alike, it sounds the same. Uh, so they didn't give any weight to that. Uh, and as regards to the other ones, you know, Rib McMuffin, McToast, McFish, McRap, McNuggets are identified to describe the characteristics of the goods and services. So basically saying, those ones is Mac plus the descriptive name or generic name even. Uh, and they say that cancellation division does not share the opinion of the applicants of the Irish Super Mac that these signs are new coined juxtaposed marks. Admittedly, uh, the trademark Mac and the descriptive term that follows after it are conjoined, uh, but uh, be that it may, the fact remains that each of the additional words, rib, muffin, toast, fish, wrap, and nuggets, has a clear and particular meaning with regards to the goods at issue, which will be perceived by the relevant consumers, irrespective of a particular way these signs are depicted. Against this background, it's concluded that the additional elements, rib, muffin, toast, fish, wrap, nuggets, do not alter the distinctive character of the trademark. Basically, what they're trying to say is the only thing distinctive about uh, Mc, McToast or McRib is Mac in the beginning. So that's what makes it a trademark, not that it says rib after it. And so that allows McDonald's for, for, for the use of the word McRib to be uh, used as uh, evidence of the use of Mac by itself. Uh, and uh, they say that this does not hold true with uh, uh, respect to Flurry. Uh, because the word flurry refers in English to a small swirling mass of something, especially snow or leaves, moved by sudden gusts of wind, a sudden short period of activity or excitement, or a number of things arriving or happening suddenly and during the same period. Okay, <laughs> So the element by itself is not descriptive. So they say flurry is not descriptive of ice cream, right? So they say rib is, so ma uh, use of McRib, proves use of Mac, but McFlurry, because Flurry by itself has distinctiveness to it, cannot prove use of Mac with respect to ice cream. Okay, and, and, and they say that 
against this background, it's considered that in the context of the evidence as a whole, the documents submitted show that the contested trademark was used in such a way as to establish a clear link between some of the registered goods in classes 29 and 30 and, uh, uh, and, um, and McDonald's and in the form which does not alter its distinctive character. And then they say use in relation to registered goods and services. So now they go, they're going to go through all the goods and services for which the trademark was registered. Uh, and uh, uh, they got approved use for each of those products and services. Uh, and uh, so they, they list them and they say uh, where the grounds for revocation for only some of the goods and services for which the contested mark is registered, the proprietor's rights will be revoked for those goods and services only. And so they go through you know, through uh, what McDonald's showed and show the you know, chicken nuggets, uh, McRib, McFish, McMcRap, all of that, and registered goods in class 30, which is sandwiches. Uh, and uh, they say registered goods in class 32. So they did not submit evidence for registered good in this class. I have been put on market as advertised under uh, contested trademark, right? So that mark is canceled. Uh, and uh, here in class 43, uh, again, they say, well, you didn't show uh, that uh, Mac or McDonald's Mac Cafe. So they, they refused Mac Cafe because the evidence was insufficient. Uh, McDonald's, they said, does not prove use of Mac. A Mac menu, again, was bad evidence. And so they killed the, the trademark in class 43 for restaurant services. And so because of that, uh, they say, they have not proven genuine use uh, for some of the registered goods in classes 29 and 30 and for all the registered goods in classes 32 and 43. And so that it's revoked. And uh, because it proved some use, that is to stay. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really what the decision is. Yeah, so really, as, as my comment to this, there's, there, there are a few lessons here. The first lesson is, you, EU continues to prove that they hate super successful American companies and that they're not going to give them any leeway uh, and recognize their greatness uh, just because they're great uh, if they uh, don't uh, have the ability to win the case on the merits, they're probably going to lose. The second very important lesson here is that when it comes to disputes, evidence and rules of procedure are probably even more important than you being right. Uh, and uh, you can win the case by highlighting some of the evidentiary flaws. You can win the case by highlighting some deficiencies in procedure. And if you do that, that's all you need to do. So McDonald's were cocky, were overconfident uh, that uh, their marks would be recognized. They didn't bother to provide good evidence with respect to the use for each of the names, and they paid a prize for that. Uh, and uh, the third lesson, the third lesson is when you're at the point when you've developed a family of marks, when you have so many brands that all share the same element, yes, you can rely on the family of marks, and yes, you can uh, try to file a trademark for just the element alone, even if you're not using the element by itself. And you may actually enjoy the trademark rights in it by itself. So uh, how bad is this for McDonald's? Not really. I mean, uh, they still have the family of marks that they can enforce against other restaurants that would try to uh, sell products under a name that starts with Mac. They can still do that, right? They don't necessarily need a registered Mac trademark for that. Uh, because their family of marks was recognized, uh, there's case law, there's precedent, they can still do that. They actually still have uh, their rights in a registered trademark for Mac for the sandwiches and, and the nuggets. So if somebody is doing that, they can still use the registration to go after them, uh, but have the value of their brand portfolio, uh, you know, ha has it, sustain some damage? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Uh, but more, more than anything, uh, it's the reputation of their legal team that sustain the big loss because really McDonald's should not be losing trademark disputes like that. Uh, they should not have lost the Big Mac case 
and they should not have lost this case at least to the full extent right uh they 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 said well we're not we'll never use it for oatmeal and we probably never will uh so they they, they admitted that that could be let go but they they should have preserved more items on that trademark than they actually did and that's the lesson you could be big you could be uh you have very deep pockets but you have to prepare for all litigation as if your life depends on it and uh, that's that's the that's the lesson that mcdonald's learned the hard way now i hope you found this video useful i hope you found it interesting and uh again you know some of my videos some are shorter some of them are long like this one and i know that you know some people tune out when it's a long video uh because all they want is a summary and the comment and we have plenty of those and some of these videos i see some people really uh, get a kick out of because they actually get to see what goes into the trademarking process or trademark dispute process. So this is one of those longer videos that I hope uh, you learn something from. Uh, if uh, you like this video or if you like the whole subject of brands and trademarks, subscribe now and get notified whenever the next one goes live, which is what the bell button is for. And if you've got a brand that you want to protect, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in North America, whether it's anywhere. So go to trademarkfactory.com and book your call with our strategy advisors. The call is free and during the call, you'll gain clarity on whether you need a trademark. You'll understand how the process works if, if, if you need that clarified. And also you'll know whether Trademark Factory is the right fit for you. So do that right now. And if nothing else, I'll see you in the next video.